Hello, Year 12. Welcome back to another video um, for our Module A study um, of language, culture and identity. So, um, in this particular video, we will be looking at uh, the poem. This is where it begins by Melinda Bobus. Um, and as always, can you please make sure that you have your poem in front of you ready to annotate as well as something to write notes on. Okay, so um, in this particular video, I'm just going to, again, briefly go through the composer's context for um, Melinda Bobis and also um, give you a little bit of, a, I guess, geographical information so you kind of know um, where I'm talking about because this particular poem does include some um, foreign language, um, which I can't read properly. So... Um, hopefully it will give you a little bit of insight, a little bit of context as to where this language is coming from. Okay, so, um, we'll start with the composer's context a little bit here. So, uh, Melinda Bobis was born in 1959. She grew up in Al Bay in the Philippines at the foot of an active volcano, which figures prominently in her writing and performance. Um, she has a Bachelor of Arts degree, um, from Aquinas University of Legazpi and a Master of Arts in Literature um, from the University of Santo Tomas in Manila. Um, so, for 10 years, she taught literature and English at uh, Philippine universities before coming to Australia in 1991 on a study grant. It's really interesting, again, because if we think back to the previous poets that we have looked at, all of them have an affiliation with some sort of higher degree or higher level of study to do with literature. Um, and then last one there, she completed a doctorate of creative arts at the University of Wollongong, one of the best universities of all time, just going to say that, um, where she taught creative writing for more than 20 years. Uh, she continues to dream new stories in Canberra. Um, so obviously born in the Philippines, has moved to Australia and now lives in Australia. Another recurring, um, fact that has, has rung true for all of our poets thus far. Oh, except, um... Jaya. Okay, so our cultural context. So I'm just going to give you, a, as I said, a bit of a geographical context, but I guess this is cultural as well. Um, so the Philippines has eight major dialects. Uh, they're listed here on the right hand side for you to look at. Um, so you've got, again, I'm going to butcher this pronunciation. So if anyone can speak fluent Filipino, I do apologize. Um, so there's Bicolano. Bisaya or Binisaya, Cebuano, Hiligan. <laughs> I'm not even going to try at this point. You can see them on the right hand side. Um, so those are the eight major dialects. Um, so the predominant languages which are taught all over the, uh, the Philippines, though, is Tagalog, Tagalog, and English. Um, although there are there is eight major dialects. Um, there are estimated between to be between 120 to 187 languages spoken. So it depends on the region, um, but there are different regional dialects and different offsets of those major, uh, those eight major dialects there. Um, that's a lot. Uh, very similar to Australia, there are a lot of different um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander dialects. Um, it's not just the one language, um, and it obviously depends on the region and where the people live and and whatnot. So. Um, I've just actually, I feel really proud because I've gone onto Google and I've even made a little video here for you to give you an idea. So, this is obviously the Philippines. Um, I've just typed in um, where she's come, she is, is said to have come from. Um, you can see there, there's the, I think the Mayon Volcano Natural Park. This is the volcano that we're referring to. So, if you can just imagine kind of this is the area in which she grew up. Uh, and this is her regional uh, region of of the Philippines where um, um, she was born, and this will kind of give us a little bit of an insight into um, the the language that she's speaking in the poem itself. Uh, because I have used a Google translator to translate some of um, the words, but it's not always accurate, um, and a lot of the meaning can be lost as well. Um, when you translate, because you can't always translate another language completely perfectly, and it always doesn't get it doesn't always get the exact meaning that the the um, composer has intended. 
So if we go back here, um, just around in this region here is where we're looking at, I believe um, this is this is her, her area here, if you're looking at my mouse. Um, so it would be a part of the Bicolano, I think Bicolano, um, region of, of the Philippines. So um, considering she did grow up in Albe, yeah, it's, I'm inferring that the dialect used in her poetry is um, Bico or Bicolano. Okay, so we're going to um, dive straight into the actual poem itself. So, as always, if you have not actually read the poem as of yet, can you please do so now? Um, so, that way you've got, obviously, a bit of an understanding about what the poem is about. And, and uh, then come back to this part of the video and we'll start um, pulling it apart for annotation um, and meaning. All right, so this is where it begins. Um, we're going to obviously start with the title of the poem. Um, for me, uh, there's this idea that language and culture through the art of storytelling helps form our identity. So, obviously, once you've read the poem, you know that this, hopefully, you know that this poem is um, maybe about stories that are being told to her as a child and um, something that her grandfather and parents... Um, uh, a, a telling her as a young, as a young child. So if we think about our own childhood, um, I know me certainly. There's this idea that you've got that older figure, whether that be a father or a mother or a guardian or a grandparent or whoever, tell you these stories from a very young age. And that might be them reading out of a book, or it might be just an oral story that they remember off the top of their head. Um, but this whole poem is very much about the act of storytelling, or the art of storytelling, I should say. Um, and how that kind of shapes us from a very young age, uh, whether or not, whether we know it or not. So, we begin when we engage with these stories. And I, th I believe that's kind of where this title is coming from. This is where it begins. This story, this, uh, this art of storytelling, this is where it begins from, a, from that very young age. Um, it may also be a reference to the cyclical nature and universality of storytelling. So, when I'm talking about that, I mean... Storytelling isn't just a linear progression. I'm not. Um, what I mean by that, it's not. It's not just you start and you finish and that's it. It goes around in a circle, cyclical. Cyclical. Sorry. So these stories are told over generations and generations. They don't just stop and start and they're never told ever again. It's cyclical. Uh, in the same way that you, you're very young when you're first told your story, and then you may pass that story on when you're a little bit older to someone else. So there's that cycle. It's, it continues on and on and doesn't just stop. And the universality, what I mean by that is it's universal. It, it's across all cultures, across all um, languages. It's across uh, the whole world. It's not just storytelling is one thing. It's, it's everyone has experienced storytelling and it's ingrained in ancient history as well. Okay. Um, it also may be a reference to the fact that all stories, such, in, and by extension, all people's lives, all cultures, etc., have some sort of beginning. There's a beginning there, and there's no real end to it. It's throughout this whole poem, they don't refer to an ending at all. It's ongoing. Okay, so we're starting the actual poem itself with "Once Upon a Time." So it's "Once Upon a Time" in Bicol, uh, Filipino, English. We tell it all over again. Sorry, we tell it over and over again. So, we're starting off with a cliche here of once upon a time. So, it's a phrase that you should f obviously be familiar with, but it's a phrase often associated with storytelling, more so in um, Western culture for fairy tales and myths and folklore for children. Um, and it's often didactic in nature. And what I mean by that is didactic is in it, it teaches you something. There's something to be learned from the story itself. Um, and that kind of links as well to this idea that this once upon a time, it's not just English, it's it's in other languages as well. So, it's kind of back to what I was saying there, the univers universality of storytelling. It's not just the one culture that, that would be um, associated with this. It's across all cultures. So, Bicol is in reference to the indigenous people of uh, the Bicol Peninsula in the Philippines, where the poet was born and raised. So, I know I do say um, to err on the side of caution when we refer to who is really the speaker of the poem, and that's why I say just use the term speaker. Um, but once you do a little bit of research, it's, in my opinion, very clear that this poem is about um, the poet's life. 
Um, okay. Uh, Filipino is a reference, obviously, to the Filipino people and or their language. And obviously, English is in a reference to the English language. All right, I'll let you copy that down. Okay, we'll move on. Sorry about that, just taking a sip. Um, we'll move on to our next stanza here. So this one is incomplete Filipino. I'm not going to even going to attempt actually um, <laughs> reading that because I definitely can't. I don't want to butcher um, that language. Um, if you see the blue line kind of coming through the middle there, the bottom part of this slide is not a part of the poem. This is my translator version. So I've put this into Google Translate. And I just need to say as a forewarning that Google Translate is definitely not accurate. Um, and also translating from another language, you lose a lot of the meaning. Um, and in my opinion, you can't really ever translate from another language perfectly. There's always going to be slight changes depending on just the, the syntax, just the way that the language is actually created. So take this with a grain of salt. The only reason I put that English translation in there so we can have kind of an understanding of what's being said here. So the translation that I'm getting here um, is, it is poisonous. I was about six, maybe five. Grandma was talking about crocodiles hiding behind the bed. Here it begins. I was six, maybe five. Grandma tells about the crab thief hiding under the bed. And she does actually go on in the next stanza as well to reference some of these ideas. So it's, it's, you'll see it's quite close. It's just not exactly spot on. Um, okay. So a bit of information. So this is written in Filipino. I'm assuming it's Bicolano, uh, Bicolano, um, the language that we're referring to back in that, um, with where the map was her, where she grew up, the region that she grew up in. Um, but I could be wrong. Um, as I said, it's loosely translated in English for the purpose of this analysis. Um, but we're seeing already with it, we've got these personal pronouns coming through with the I was about six, maybe five. Um, and this is where I'm saying it's possibly the composer's voice here. Um, so Bobus's voice here. And it's a very reflective tone as well that's coming through. She's thinking back to when she was a child, six, maybe five. So we're getting again this, this thought back when she was in the Philippines, back when she was a little girl. Um, it's a very much a reflective um, poem. Um, there's a metaphor coming through here as well. It is poisonous. I'm just hoping that's what it actually translates to, but it is poisonous. This idea that these stories can invade you much like poison, but it's also a negative tone coming through here as well. The obviously poison is, is quite negative. Um, it can really injure you, possibly even be fatal, um, but it becomes a part of you. So these stories can affect you in negative ways. Um, but they can def definitely be a part of you is what I'd be getting from this. The fact that these stories can invade your body um, and infect you, whether that be a good thing or a bad thing. Okay, so, um, oops, I forgot that little part there. That's fine. So, we've got auditory language coming through here in this next stanza. So, this is where it begins. I'm six years old, perhaps five. So, this is where we're seeing there's a similarity between my translation and the actual poem. I'm six years old, perhaps five. Grandmother is storytelling about the crab stealer hiding under the bed. Each story word crackles under the ghost's teeth, infernal under my skin. I shiver. But perhaps this is where it begins. Grandfather teasing me with that lady in the hills, walking into his dream, each time a different colour of dress, a different attitude under my skin. I am bereft of constancy. Literal at six years old, perhaps five. So, if we look at that first stanza on this slide here, um, there's definitely that use of auditory language being um, conveyed here. Um, we've got the word crackles there, um, almost onomatopoeic in the way that it's created, it, it's used to create that hellish fearful image. And you, you pair that with this idea of infernal, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, I might even just pop it up here just for, here we go. You've got that idea of, um, crackles. So if you think about fire, the way that a, a fire would crackle, that's that onomatopoeia coming through there in that particular description. And if you look on the right-hand side here, sorry, it's not in order. 
you've got that religious imagery coming through, infernal. It's referring to the characteristics of hell or the underworld, to this idea of fire and brimstone. Um, interestingly, the predominant religion in the Philippines is Roman Catholic, and there's that idea of purgatory and that idea of the afterlife in hell um, for people who sin. So, there's this fear that's being created here through this story. So, that's an interesting insight, I think, anyway, as possibly a little girl who's growing up in a maybe a religious family or a religious household who's kind of instilling this fear about um, doing the wrong thing and being a sinner, and that's the result of what would happen. So, it's this, again, It's it, in my opinion, it's quite a negative feeling. It's that you, you're scared. She's scared, clearly. That truncated sentence here coming up here, she says, I shiver, it builds tension, reflects the profound effects these stories have on, on her as a child. So, storytelling has the power to to strike fear into someone, and that clearly can change someone's identity as well. Um, if that makes that person maybe be a bit more, um, you know, God abiding, maybe that person is going to toe the line a bit more and not want to, you know, be a quote sinner. Um, it can impact the way that that person grows up and the and the. the th- the things that they believe and who they believe in or what they believe in. So, these stories, this language is very powerful from a young age. And I can't help but think that that particular first stanza that we're looking at on the screen here has a very, very powerful and very religious tone coming through, through the imagery she's got there. Um, And she's almost recognizing that fear that was instilled in her as a young child. Okay, um, and then with that second tone we're, we're getting here about the grandfather teasing him, it's, I, I, in my interpretation, I'm, I'm, I'm noticing a, a shift in the actual tone itself. So, there's a change in the tone here as a speaker recounts, I think, a more uh, a lighthearted story that she remembers from her childhood. The idea of the grandfather teasing her, it's playful, it's, it's not anywhere near as fearful as that first um, stanza where the grandmother was telling her um, whatever the story was about. Um, so, to me, this kind of shows that, you know, these stories can be completely different. There's a variety of different stories. It's not just the one type of story. It's not just the one emotion that someone can feel. Stories have the ability to make you feel lots of different things. And this is all tying back to that power of language, which is definitely a connection to our module. Um, you've got an idiom here, this ID. Um, under under my skin is what I was referring to there. A different attitude under my skin. So, it's not literally under, under the person's skin, but it's that idiom. And if we're not familiar with an idiom, it's essentially a saying that doesn't make sense literally, um, but it would make sense in a specific context or to specific cultures. So, we know that um, under my skin means it's something that's kind of ingrained within you. Um, so, we've got the idiom there, under my skin. It's referring to her having a different reaction to this story as opposed to the scary one prior, but definitely it's still under my, under her skin here as well. So, these ideas that, you know, you've got this terrifying, hellish, um, religious uh, story coming through in the first stanza that's kind of stayed under her skin. So, maybe that's, you know, stuck with her. She doesn't want to do wrong um, by her God or she doesn't want to, you know, be subject to these this afterlife um, of hell in infernal fire and brimstone. But then she's still got that, she's got a different attitude under her skin with her grandfather's story because it's more lighthearted. She reflects maybe more fondly on that particular story. And even when she says there, I am bereft of constancy, bereft meaning deprived or lacking, constancy meaning unchanging or constant. Um... She's bereft of something, she, what she's basically saying there, she's, it's not just the one story. She's, she's getting, being given a variety of stories, okay? So, she, everything is, it's, it's, it's different. It's not constant. And I think what she is trying to say there is that these stories that she's been opened up to are, there's a variety of them and that's important. Okay, um, as we move on to that next stanza, or the next couple of stanzas. Um, we've got, again, very, very quickly, I'll just say here, or oh, this is where it begins. It's, it's it put on its own line. Um, it's that repetition again. So, it's there's an emphasis being placed there that um, 
this is where the poem begins. This is where the story begins. This is where someone's identity begins. It's quite an important um, part of what she's trying to say here, okay? That's why it's put on its own line. Um, she says, mother reviewing for her college college Spanish exam. Ojos, ojos, labios, manos. Suddenly under my skin, long before I understood. Eyes, how they conjure ghosts under the bed. Lips, how they make ghosts speak. Hands, how they cannot be silent. Eyes, lips, hands. Bit of context for you. So, Spain was invaded and colonized, uh, and colonized, sorry, the Philippines in 1565. Uh, there were European visitors prior to that, but this is recorded as the date in which um, Spain, um, I suppose, invaded. Um, so, that is why the Philippines um, have uh, that, you know, that Spanish heritage, Spanish history. Um, and possibly why the mother is reviewing for her college Spanish exam. Um, to me, I think the the ghost that she's referring to here um, is almost symbolic of the power of her imagination. Um, it represents the fear that the story conjures, a physical manifestation of fear. So, even the term conjure, which we'll get to in a moment, um, but this ghost is is this terrifying figure for her. This this idea that, um, or, or what this if we go back to the grandmother's actual, um story, it's this terrifying, um, you know, image, this idea that she's conjured in her, in her head all simply through the power of words, the power of language. Um, the ojos, labios, manos translates to eyes, lips, hands. So, to me, the way that I uh, infer this is, is this is the art of storytelling. So, our eyes or even our mind's eye. So, it could be our physical eyes and what we visually see or our mind's eye in that what we are imagining in our own um, mind when we listen to a story or read a story. Picturing these descriptions, the lips of the storyteller as they recount their tale, so that oral tradition of speaking and, and, and telling the story orally. Um, the hands moving to, to tell their story. They're not, they're not still or silent. They're not just, you know, by their side while the story is being told. It could also even be referencing the fact that um, stories are written as well and those hands are being used to write those stories. Okay. All right, so we'll move on to that next stanza. I remember too, father, gesturing, invoking once upon a time. This is where it begins. Story, word, gesture, all under my skin. At six years old, perhaps five. So, she's continuing to reflect here. I remember too, father, gesturing. So, she, we're going back now to, to her being a kid again. She remembers her father also being a storyteller. Is an art someone calls... Um, it's not someone calls, it's an important role. So, it's not just something you have, you have to like, call upon it. It's like you're, um, you're asking to be able to be, to, to be a storyteller, to use that power. It's not just, it's not just you're telling a story, it's, it's more than that. There's an importance being given there, invoking it once upon a time. Um, so, all parts of the art of storytelling, all elements are ingrained in her. So, from a very young age, she's had all these family members around her that have invoked this power of storytelling upon her and she's, it's been, it's a part of her and that's where we're getting that repetition of um, under my skin. Again, it's, it's a part of her. You got another uh, p uh, piece of repetition here of her age. She keeps referencing at six years old, perhaps five. She continues to emphasize her youth. And to me, it's it's the importance of the impact of hearing these stories at a young age. It has shaped her from a very young age. Um, what we learn as, as very little kids is something that we take into our adolescence and take into our adulthood. And it shapes, you know, what we believe in and, and who who we, um, you know, even believe in. So, the idea of humans, um, of children as sponges in a sense, the idea that they kind of absorb these ideas. We absorb these stories, they make us who we are, they help us form our identity. So, this language, if we think back to our module, think back to our rubric, this language has a very, very close knit connection to our identity, okay? Um, 
And obviously there's a clear connection to her culture as well. So language, culture, identity, that's where we're drawing on all the, these three pillars that we're looking at in this module. Language has the power to, to form our identity from a very young age is what she's trying to talk about here. All right, we will move on to our next stanza. And so this poem is for my father, mother, grandmother, grandfather, and all the storytellers, the conjurers who came before us. They made us shiver, not just over crab stealers hiding under the bed or a lady uncertain of her garb. They made us shiver also over faith, over tenderness, or that little tickle when a word hits a hidden crevice in the ear. Just air, heralding the world, all worlds that we think we dream up alone. So, a time shift now is, is, we're back to the present day. She's no longer reflecting. She, we're back to our present day. We're back to the, the speaker as of now as she's writing this. Um, she is now the storyteller. She's telling this story through her poem itself. It's a bit meta in that way, but she is telling us this story. She is now the storyteller. And it, in my opinion, refers back to that cyclical nature that we talked about right at the beginning. This idea that storytelling isn't linear. It isn't from the start to an end. It's it's, it goes in a cycle. It's generational as well in the term, in the fact that it's it's passed down from generation to generation. It's some sort of tradition, okay? So, the grandfather passed it down possibly to, to, their, to their son who's passed it down to the daughter and, and the grandfather even and the grandmother to the daughter. So, it's, it's cyclical, okay? Um, you've got that supernatural imagery coming through again. You got these links to the supernatural imagery used earlier in the terms of the, the, the word conjurers. So to conjure something is very almost magical, witch-like in a, in a way that you're um, usually conjuring something up, such as a potion or a spell. Um, so th it's, in my opinion, just suggesting that storytelling is as a form of magic. You know, it it has the power to conjure people and things into existence through words. If you really break it down, and this always trips me out when I think about it, but what you're reading right now on your computer or your phone or whatever you're watching on is literally just pixels. But if this was a written word or a written piece, like a page, it's just lines in a book. It's just shapes. That it's, it's, it's literally just shapes that are created. And then we're interpreting meaning from it. And we're putting all these shapes together or you're listening to my voice right now and it's literally just my voice box making noises into something that you understand. I think the power of language is, and the power of words is, you know, something that we don't really value in today's culture. And this may be something that she's referring to as well. So, this language has the power to conjure people and things into existence. And it definitely has the power to shape who we are and our identity, especially from a young age. So, you've got that personification coming through as well. Um, where it's saying, uh, or that little tickle when a word hits a hidden crevice in the E. These words are alive. She's giving these words human characteristics. They have the power, they have powers beyond what we would normally think. It's not just literally a word. There's meaning beyond that word. Um, again, the personification here, these words are, are just air literally. So, it's literally just me breathing right now to make words. Um, and they have the power to become so much more. And they have the power to do so much more as well. Okay. So, I'm going to move on to, I believe, one of our final stanzas, if not the final stanza. No, storytelling is not lonely, not as we claim, in our little rooms lit only by a lamp or a late computer glow. Between the hand and the pen, or the eye and the screen, they have never left, they who story told before us, they who are under our skin. We're getting this idea coming through now that we are connected to our ancestors and culture through storytelling. So, obviously, when she's referring to the term they, um she's referring to the ancestors and people of the past who created these stories that we continue to tell. Okay. Um, they never leave us. They're always a part of us. They're under our skin. Okay. Um, you know, the cyclical nature of storytelling again, coming through this idea that it's never ending. It continues and it's passed down from generation to generation. These stories aren't, 
um, a one-off. There's something that are uh, that is continued to be told throughout time. Okay, so they give us substance, and what I mean by that is they they make us who we are. The storytellers make us whole beyond the superficial layer of skin. So every value that we have, every um, every idea that we have, who we are, while there is, in my opinion, you know, some inherent um, consciousness within us that makes us believe in right or wrong, we are really influenced by what we're being told and we're, in the stories that we're told, whether they, they be fictional stories or whether they be real stories. Um, but these are passed down. They, they give us substance as people. Okay, I lied. There's one more stanza, so we'll move on to that now. Um, so, perhaps they even conjured us, but not alone. Storytelling, all our eyes collect into singular seeing, our lips test one note over and over again, our hands follow each other's arc, each sweep of resolve, eyes, lips, hands conjoined, the umbilical cord restored. So, once again, we're getting uh, a bit reflective here in what the, the speaker is talking about. Um, again, perhaps they even conjured us. Perhaps these stories created our identity. It's kind of what I was saying before, um, but not alone. So, there are other things that help create our identity, but this definitely shapes them in some way, these stories. Um, this language has shaped our culture, has shaped our identity, and this is a clear link to the module that we are studying. But their use of inclusive pronouns here when they're saying um, us, okay, our, the community of storytellers, the power of story storytelling to connect individuals. So, it's not just a standalone thing. He, he, she says, but not alone. Storytelling has the ability to connect people, okay? And it, if, if it wasn't for the people working together and people connecting, stories wouldn't be able to be shared, okay? If there was just alone, then no one would hear these stories. The fact that people are sharing these stories connects individuals. She's got language for the art of storytelling, connecting ancestors and connecting to their culture. Um, and then you've got a bit of symbolism here at the end as well, the umbilical cord restored. So, there's a few different ways I think you could interpret this. But for me personally, the way that I interpret that, um, especially the idea of it being restored, um, is that the umbilical cord perhaps represents that reconnection to culture. Okay, so how you come back to your ancestors, how you come back to where you're from. Um, that reconnection to family and that reconnection to the past. You know, again, goes back to that cyclical nature of storytelling. We're going all the way back um, to when that story was first told or first conjured. Okay, that brings us up to the end of this particular poem. We have one more to go. Um, again, thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.